Hello, this is Off the Pulpit here on Catholic SG Radio. Welcome. If it's the first time you're uh, tuning in to us, well, we just want to welcome you. I'm Andre Acha and my co-host is Beatrice de Cruz. Yes. Now, if it's the first time you're listening to Off the Pulpit, mm -hmm. this is what the program is all about. Yes. I'll leave it to Beats. Yeah, so we invite members of our clergy to come and discuss matters of faith or share their vocation stories in the case of our guest today. Right. So today our guest is Father Jean Gabriel. He's born in Singapore and he attended Catholic High School before studying music at the Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts, or also known as NAFA. So he graduated in 2009 with a Bachelor of Arts Honours degree in music. And after pursuing his Honours degree in music, uh, Father John Gabriel worked as a freelance musician and a music instructor for a few years while discerning a vocation to the religious life. That's right. And then in 2016, he goes over to Rome and he joins the Roman province of the Dominican Order. Now, he made a solemn profession uh, in 2022 and he was ordained to the priesthood just a few months ago in May. Correct, Father? Yes. Uh, he's definitely Singaporean. Uh, so, <laughs> Father Jean Gabriel Pofila, he works uh, outside of the Archdiocese of Singapore. Welcome. It's so nice to have you, Father. Thank you for having me. Not it's at nice all. To be here. So, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah. So, I'm uh, Father Jean Gabriel. Um, well, you know, well, you you guys mentioned most of it already. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> I believe us, so, so we go on, we'll dis you guys will discover even more. Okay, so what, 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 what were you like when you were in your youth, for instance? Um, well, to be honest, I wasn't really interested in going to church, I must say. So, okay, well, that's mine honest. Was, uh, well, I was baptized as a Catholic. I mean, I went to church on Sundays uh, mm. most of the time. Mm. and um, But what wasn't something that really interests me. Right. And um, it was only later on in life that I grew to love the faith. Ah, yeah. okay. So, was it? How did that change come about? Was it uh, friends that you had? Was it school that you attended? What were the influences? So, I think the the changing point came um, when I was dating, and I was dating a, a Protestant. Uh, uh, a Protestant girl. I was going to ask you whether you had a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know. <don't. laughs> okay. And um, and so she she began to pose a lot of questions uh, about my Catholic faith and a lot of uh, criticisms towards the Catholic faith as as they use, they don't normally do. Right. Um, and then she, be, uh, myself, being somewhat thick skinned, <laughs> I decided not to uh, to give in so easily and decided to. Uh, understand how I could respond to the questions and to the criticisms that were coming my way. Right. And so I began to study uh, apologetics mostly and um, right. so, so began to study the Catholic faith and come to understand it. And the more I understood it, the more I knew about it, the more I grew in love with it. Mm. So that was where, that was sort of the changing point for me. Wow. Mm. So now for the, not, that you've answered the spicy question of did you have a girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> now that you know okay. that. Oh, okay. I didn't think that was a very spicy question. <laughs> <laughs> that was the spiciest question. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the spiciest one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how old were you when you felt that you had that calling to religious life or even considered? Like how old were you at that point of time? Um, I think I must have been 17 or 18. Mm. Mm. Yes. Okay. You were still in school. Yes, I was at NAFA studying music. Right, right. You were in Catholic High. Yes. Were you, was the environment also, uh, did it help uh, in sort of uh, warming your interest towards the faith? Or was it something, was it really your, the interest of this girl? <laughs> yeah, I think that was more. It was really, was more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think that anything, anything, anything Catholic that went out in Catholic high, I kind of just ignored. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yes, yes, yes. So. What was your family's response when you finally said, um, I think I'll go and be a religious? Um, I think um, many had seen that change in me that mm. I was becoming very serious about my okay. faith. Mm. Okay. And so in a certain sense, it didn't come as a, as a surprise. Right. Um, for my mother, um, since I'm the only son, I have two sisters, but I'm the only son, you know. So, right. So that was uh, rather difficult for her. Yeah, um, I'm sure. But she came to accept it. Eventually. Right, mm. right. And your sisters? I think they were happy. I mean, they, they were, you know. Supportive? Yeah. 
Were they surprised? Mm, half and half, I think. I think, like I said, you know, because they had seen the transformation in, right. in me. Uh, so I don't think they were completely surprised. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Father, you were talking about the changes in you that they had seen. What, yeah. what sort of changes did they see? Or did they like tell you about it? Like, eh, you seem different, but how so? Yeah. Um, yeah, and no, I mean, I'm thinking, it's just, you know, being more serious about my faith, going to mass frequently, daily, mm. at a certain point. Um, you know. Were you active in parish work or? Not that active. But I mean, I did, you know, take my prayer life very seriously. Go to mm. go to adoration, go to mass. Mm. Mm. Um, say my rosary. Um, but it must be said, so my sisters were overseas most of the time. So then they didn't, they weren't, they didn't live that change uh, first person. Ah, right? okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. But it was, I guess, your mum yeah. who, who saw that transformation. Yes. For want of a better word, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so as you discerned and trained for religious life, mm -hmm. what was difficult for you? Uh, I think I'm a very indecisive person. So really? actually making that decision to join religious life was the, the hardest thing. I mean, mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of doubts come into your head. You, sure. know, you start to think, is it, is, it, is it, you know, should I really do this or right? not? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. And I think um, a lot of young people think about the religious vocation and think that they must, they must have absolute certainty yes. before joining religious life. Right. But you're not going to have absolute certainty with regards to the things of God. I mean, mm. I mean, of course, in, in so if he does reveal something to us and things are a matter of faith, then we have absolute certainty. Right. But, for, but for certain decisions in life, mm. this is a prudential decision on our part and requires discernment on yes. our part, but always requires a certain leap that we have to take right. without absolute certainty. Right. There are very few decisions in life that we can take that have absolute certainty. That's so true. I mean, marriage is the same. Marriage is the mm. same, you know? Yeah. You just discern and you're saying, I believe that this is God's will for me and I'm going to, you know, do my best to follow his will. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to do it. Right. And what was the, the biggest change that you had to make when you joined religious life? Uh, put on a habit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good habit. That's a good habit. Um, biggest change that I had to make? Well, I guess you get used to living with different people mm. and you get used to not being to, able to exercise your freedom in the same way. Of course, your freedom is somewhat limited. Right. Mm. Right. So you're living with a community of men whom you've never met before. Never met before. Uh, of In all a normal ages. situation, I would probably never have chosen to <laughs> live right. with them, but <laughs> that's true. But God has put me together with them, and so you but, accept that, right? Right, mm, right. Mm. Father, you also um, mentioned. Um, in the Catholic news in May 2022, so uh, this was on the occasion of Vocation Sunday. So yeah. you mentioned that, um, so we quote you, okay. in offering him our freedom in religious life, because you were talking about freedom as mm -hmm. well, we are essentially offering him everything that we have and everything that we are. This is especially so in our age, which is so fixated on individual freedoms, often losing sight of the common good. I would have to say Mary's docility to divine providence inspires me let it be done to me according to your word, is for me perhaps the most beautiful phrase in the Gospels. And thanks to her simple yes, the course of history changed forever and God came into the world. How many wonderful things we can achieve if we too say yes to God. Mm. Yeah. And so you mentioned that and we were wondering, did um, our Blessed Mother play a major role in your vocation and your formation? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. So... <clears throat> Since my um, drawing closer to the faith sprung from an encounter with a Protestant uh, girl. Mm. So, of course, the, the, the number one mm. question and criticism that you receive from uh, Protestants is, is about Our Lady yes. and the so-called uh, worship of Our Lady that Catholics mm. um, practice. And so, yeah, one of the very first things that I had to do was uh, discover the figure of Our Lady, discover what is uh, the way that the Catholic Church approaches Our Lady. Yeah. And uh, there I discovered a, cert, a, a great richness. You know, I began to pray the rosary. And um, so so one thing that was missing in my 
my little biography um, is that I, I didn't join the Dominicans immediately. Mm. Ah, uh, I joined a, a group of uh, Franciscans, uh, mm. not uh, not the ones in Singapore. I joined them in Australia. It's a mm. sort of like a, a group of um, Franciscans who follow a very Marian spirituality. Right. Um, and so, very uh, an essential part of the life was living the li- a total consecration to Our Lady. Wow. And so. That was a very important part of uh, that charism and a very part, important part of uh, my own life, which I found um, mm. that helped me to grow a lot in the spiritual life, you know, right. practicing this total consecration to Our Lady and trusting oneself completely to Our Lady. And that's something that I've always carried with me, even now as a Dominican. Right. Mm. right. And of course, as a Dominican, you know, the, the rosary is very that's much right. linked to the Dominican order. Yes. Mm. And so the rosary is even greater part of my life now and something that, you know, I try to promote and mm. to encourage people to pray, to draw closer to our Lord through Our Lady. Something that mm. struck me a little bit um, more also, you know, in, in that um, quote of yours, which I pulled out, Last night, <laughs> doing um, your homework. Very good. <laughs> um, is you were talking about individual freedom? Yes, mm. and you mentioned it also in a sense when you had joined uh, a religious community, living with people whom you've not met before, and mm. and, and having to get used to them as well as. A, but then, in today's age as well. Individual freedom is somehow, you know, the talk of, I mean, it's on top of everybody's mind. Yes. Mm. Uh, a lot of it is, as we said, you know, I, me and myself, we are very self-centered. Mm. So was it easy to let go of your own struggles as well internally? And how did you see that parallel with our ladies' fiat, so to speak, yes. mm. with what you were going to live out. Yeah, I think, I mean, the first thing we need to understand about um, individual freedom, right? Freedom is a gift from God. It mm. is. And it's a gift that God has given us for a purpose, to be used for the good. So our freedom is not something that is uh, indifferent. Mm. Our freedom is for the good, to be able to choose what is good. That is why God gave us freedom. And that's why... You know, Our Lady, even though she was immaculate and she was preserved from sin, she was the freest of all men, of all men and women, because she had that complete openness to say yes to the good. And her freedom was used for the good. And so we need to understand that our freedom is to be able to choose the good, to choose what God offers us and what mm. God wants of us. And so, of course, it kind of, at the beginning, and even you know, it'll continue. There will, be, there will be a struggle for us. You know, right. there is uh, this battle within ourselves. Yes, because sometimes we want to choose what is egoistic. Mm. I mean, the, the the consequences of sin are, are always present in us in that sense. Right. None of us are immaculately conceived, as far as I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. So, but we must, you know, continue to live that struggle because the grace of God is always there helping us to live that struggle and help. Uh, he wants us to choose the good. Mm. Mm. And so he is helping us. On our us. own. Yeah. In our, with our own free will to with choose our that free good. will to choose a good. And his grace is working in us to move us in that direction. And so we have to trust in God's grace and seek to do always what is good and what right. is his will. Right. Just just a little bit of a divergence okay. in, in the uh, the readings that we've been reading at, at Mass these last few days. Mm-hmm. We've been, um, we've had God giving Moses the Ten Commandments, right? Yes. Um, the thing is, people today look at any kind of code of, of law or yeah. commandments, yeah. right, uh, as a form of slavery. You know, you know, uh, you you you're trying to put me in a cage and 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 you know suffocate me and all mm. that. But God's thinking is so different. He gave the Ten Commandments so that we could actually be freer and love freer and, you know, be who we are truly supposed to be. But why is it that we twist it around and make him look bad? I mean, 
it's not that difficult for us to understand the the point of rules, you know. And what would happen <laughs> if we, you know, would you feel very free and very really convinced to go out onto the road if you knew that there were no road rules whatsoever and nobody was following the rules, nobody was following the law? Uh, I live in Italy, so um, <laughs> they drive generally they don't follow the rules, and it's a scary experience. Yes, you know, you do have to be very alert. And it's like, okay. Yes, I've seen that first. <laughs> So, I mean, the, the fact that you know that there are these rules and people are following these rules helps right. you to live, helps you to drive with greater security and greater freedom in a certain That's right. sense. Mm. And so why is it different with your moral life, with your life of faith? Mm. Yeah. yeah, but still. So uh, those rules are there to give you certain boundaries within which you can know, you know that you can exercise your freedom, within which there is a certain security and, and so, so these rules serve as a certain um, tutor towards right. living out the good. Right. So they are, to, they are there to teach us how to do the good. Mm. Mm. In monastic mm. life, mm. Um, prayer is very much center of the way you live it yeah. within the monastery. Are you all very much like the Benedictines and the Cistercians where you pray seven times a day? Uh, we pray a few times a day. Not, <laughs> yes. not as many as seven. Problem, not as many as seven. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, in common, we pray three three to four times a, a day. Right, including Mass. Yeah. Right. So morning prayer and Mass. and uh, Right. So that rhythm of prayer yes. needed some getting used to, I'm sure, as well. Uh, well, no, actually, I think uh, as a layperson already, at a certain point, I had tried to I had tried to make a certain adopt a certain rhythm of life, ah. mm. especially because uh, because I worked as a freelancer, right? And so the rhythm of life that I had was quite erratic. Mm. And so at a certain point, a, a priest said to me, "Well, no, you can't just keep on living like that in this erratic. But you need to have some sort of stability in your life." And I think it's very good for for everybody to adopt some sort of mm. stability, a stable rhythm in life. Um, even if if your job doesn't allow for it, but at least knowing that you know when you wake up you're going to do this, and when you, before you go to bed you're going to do this, you're going to say these prayers, you're going to go to mass, or right. You know, that does I think that does help us to grow spiritually, having that sp that stability and not just depending on your wild inspiration every day. Mm. Mm. Sure. Yeah, wonderful. Father, I was also wondering because yes. we spoke quite a bit about freedom, yeah. um, and discerning vocation is something that. Um, as a young person, this is something that we are very interested in and we take very seriously. So what would you say to young people who are discerning their vocation? You know, such that um, just like Mary, we are able to say yes to any vocation or calling freely and with commitment. What would you say to young people? Um, well, there are a couple of things to consider. Um, mm. I think one of the phrases that has always struck me, you know, uh, our Lord says, uh, greater love than this no man hath than to lay down his life for his friends. Right. Mm. And so the greatest way that we as religious express our love for God and for mankind and for, you know, every one of our friends, every member of our family mm. is by laying our da uh, down our lives through the religious vows. Mm. So what we are doing is very much an act of love towards others. Right, and also we need to remember that you know, yes, it is true. It is a life of sacrifice. We are, we do have to take up our cross and follow Christ, mm. but God has promised us great rewards. Right, right, right. And um, you know, I can sure I can assure anyone who is discerning the religious life that um, you know, having worked before, having had a girlfriend before, having lived as a religious, that um, um, I found no greater joy and peace than doing mm. what I'm doing now, and so. No, don't be afraid to make that jump. Right. Mm, take the leap of faith. Take the leap of faith. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> Dear sisters and brothers, you're listening to Off the Pulpit here on Catholic SG Radio. And we're very privileged, very happy to have with us a Singaporean, uh, Father Jean-Gabriel Pofia. Uh, Pofila, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's <good>. right. <laughs> uh, he's a Dominican friar of the Roman province. Um, and he was recently ordained to the priesthood uh, in May this year. Um, Father... Why Rome? <laughs> um, How is it that you chose? I mean, there are so many other provinces, right, of yeah. uh, the Dominican provinces, but why Rome? Uh, so, the, so as I mentioned before, I joined this group of Franciscans 
I joined them in Australia. In Australia. Then, mm-hmm. then I was in the Philippines for a while. Right. Some formation. And then finally they sent me to Rome uh, to study. Right. And it was while I was in Rome that I got to know the Dominicans. Ah, okay. And, I see. Uh, and then, yes. And I discerned with the Dominicans and decided that this was uh, what God dis- wanted for me. Right. And uh, so I jumped ship. Wow. And uh, since I got to know them there, I joined them there. Right. Okay. Still, okay. Uh, I mean, um, Rome is a very so particular was, situation. So yeah. So it, providential. Yeah, it's been quite the adventure following God's providence. I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you know, but you had to, and then you had to study everything in in Italian and and all of that. Mm. Yeah. Yes. And wow. you just took it like uh, a duck to water. <laughs> well, I don't know about a duck to water. <laughs> there were some struggles, but uh, yeah, but we did it. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Father, what's it like ministering like overseas full time also, and what is the most challenging experience for you um, over there? Um. But I think in, in general, Singaporeans are quite adaptable. You know, we're used to living with many different you know, different cultures, different points of view, different mentalities. Mm. So uh, I didn't find it very, very difficult adapting myself uh, in Italy. Mm. The, 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 yeah, the worst thing about Italy is the lack of efficiency efficiency and organization. <laughs> uh, we didn't learning. hear that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, other than that, you know, uh, um, it's it's been quite um, enjoyable. I mean, right. you just adapt yourself to a, to a, to a new culture, and, and I mean, recognize that you know this is part of your mission. This is you know how you have to um, work out God's will for you in your life, and you you do your best. Mm. Could you stay in touch with family? Um, yes, yes, yes. I mean, with modern technology, it's um, yeah, not much of a problem. Right. Yeah. Nice. Now that you're working within, uh, I mean, in Rome or in Europe for that matter, I see uh, on your Instagram, you sometimes go around. Um, Would you say the experiences of the faith for the youth Mm -hmm. are universal? The same struggles, the... I mean, the experience or the expressions of the heart and Mm -hmm. looking for faith as well? Um, yes and no, I, I think. Although, because the, the situation of the church and the situation of society is mm. different mm, yeah. in different places. No, that's true. So too. the challenge that they, they face are different. Mm. So I think I think in Singapore, we have very much a young society and a young church. Right. But whereas in, in Europe, what we're facing is, is a very old society and a very older church. Yeah. And it's churches which is very much in decline. Mm. Mm. And there's a lot of struggle against a very secular mentality. Over te- oh, no, uh, although technically Italy is culturally still Catholic, mm. but in reality it's not, not so, so much. Yeah, and so for a young person, there there's a big struggle, and you have to be really, really, really strong in your faith because you're going to have no other support. Mm. Right, and um, so Europe, and yeah, Europe uh, proposes its very, very particular challenges. Right, so. Do you have an opportunity to work very often with the youth there? Uh, yeah, so I directed a youth group uh, for a while. Mm. And uh, so we, we, we sought to give like very, very substantial formation uh, to these youth because they do need some very, very substantial things to keep them right. going. And we do need to, to, to face the current challenges that society proposes to them. Mm. Wow. Okay. Um What are your thoughts, Father, on youth's perceptions about the priesthood or religious life today? Um, is living a life of service or a mission and being single mostly, you think, would that still have some sort of attraction for some for a young person? Yes, of course. <laughs> of course it will. But it must be understood that above all, it is... Um, I believe that many youth do feel that feel that attraction. Mm. Mm. They try to ignore it, perhaps ah. push it aside, because mm. um, the attraction to the religious life um, 
comes from God. Yeah. Right, the attraction, attraction to marriage is something that everybody feels on a natural level because mm. marriage is a natural institution yes. which has then been raised to the level of a sacrament. Yes. Mm. So for somebody to feel an attraction to marriage, that is something that is completely natural. Right. Mm? Even, even Even I feel an, an attraction to marriage. Of course. But if on top of this attraction to marriage, you feel some sort of attraction, it might be very small at the beginning, mm. to a celibate form of life, to a life where you consecrate yourself completely to God and uh, in which you would have to sacrifice marriage. Mm. Now there are two things, uh, two things are possible because it's not natural, this attraction. Right. It's either unnatural, It's you, there might be a psychological problem, mm. that's possible. Yeah. But I think in the most, in the case of most young people I've met, it's not the case. You know, they're quite you know well-balanced young people. Right. Mm. And in that case, what is it? It's supernatural. It's God's grace that is working in you, yeah. who is putting this attraction in you towards a certain form of life. Because God doesn't work against your nature. Right. He works above your nature and he moves you above your nature. He moves moves you towards something that is supernatural. And you know, God's grace is, you know, working in you. He wants you to do this, and so he'll put that attraction in you. Mm. That's so beautifully said, Father. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense, actually. Mm. Mm. <laughs> but then again, you see, it takes courage for that individual to, for any individual, yeah. Yeah. to respond. And then, like you said, take a leap of faith. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And it is, um, <laughs> again, it's, because, it's, it's, because it's a completely supernatural life. Yeah. yeah. So in a certain sense, that courage can also only come, only come from God. And so if you are discerning a vocation, if you do feel that attraction, to God, uh, to towards the celibate life, towards the religious life. I mean, your first step is 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 not to you know start writing down with a piece of paper, start doing research, reading books. Your first step is to go in front of the tabernacle. Mm. Thank God for this attraction that you feel in you, because He has chosen you for something really special and really amazing. Indeed, and ask Him to help you to discern, mm. to to understand this attraction, right. and ask you uh, and ask Him to help you to make the right decision and to make that leap. That, and it can only come from grace. It can only come from God. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Mm. wow. Thank you so much for sharing that, Father. You're welcome. Um, yeah. So I, I think with a growing number of uh, Singaporean religious and lay persons, you know, going out to do missionary work um, overseas, um, what signal does it send to the local archdiocese and the universal church, Father? I mean, Singapore is quite a globalized society and already yes. lots of Singaporeans are working overseas mm -hmm. in any case. So, I mean, that, that lots of Singaporean religious are overseas. Yeah. I mean, just part of this trend that seems to be there. And it's part of the fact that, you know, like I, like I said, in, in Europe, the church is in decline. Mm. And so there's a sort of a reverse missionary movement now. Right. 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 Yeah. And yeah. it's, um, so, I mean, a lot of people from Asia and from Africa are now going to Europe and uh, helping to, build up the faith there to keep it from, you know, completely falling. Mm. Which is sort of sad in a way, mm -hmm. but also I think exciting because I, th I feel that whatever it is, it will stir uh, any diocese or any community where the seeds of vocation are sown and mm -hmm those seeds have become really uh, fruitful or these mm. communities become fruitful with, with vocations and then to send that out, I, I can only see good things yeah, I mean, it's, um, coming. I mean, it's that same, that missionary spirit yeah. um, works in many different ways. But you know, you said something interesting as well. We are, the church in Singapore is a very young church, yeah. even though we're 200 years old, mm. uh, compared to <laughs> Europe, which is my goodness, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're, we're truly still an infant in, mm. in, in that sense. But for, 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 for us to be able to send uh, homegrown vocations mm -hmm. outwards, I, I, it is a sign of the vibrancy of, of the faith here. Yeah. Mm. And it's like, because it is, it is a young church, it has that, that energy, it has that life. Right. So it wants to go out. It wants to expand, right? That's a, that's a natural thing. Yeah, absolutely. The World Youth Day is but a few days 
away. Yeah. What would be your prayer for the young pilgrims who are now massing, <laughs> yeah. massing towards uh, Lisbon? Lisbon. Yeah. There can be a tr- truly an opportunity for them to to uh, to know Christ and to encounter Him, and to grow in love with Him. And so this um, this this encounter with Christ has to transform, right, the youth. And even if they don't become religious, no. I mean, as long as they, I mean, what's important is that you know they try to follow Christ. They take up their fo- cross and follow Christ. And, and that it can, it can be in marriage. It can be in religious life. It can be a single life as yeah, well. Whatever. Mm. Right, right. Father, thank you so much for for sharing with us your your thoughts and putting you know things so nicely into perspective. And I, I we truly enjoy this this conversation. Would you, before we go, uh, can we invite you to say a prayer um, and pray if you could for the youth, okay, um, and and the Church of Singapore, okay. Let us begin by asking the intercession and the help of Our Lady in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother Mother of God, God, pray pray for for us sinners now and at the the hour of our our death. death. Amen. Amen. Through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, may Almighty God, Bless all the young people who are going to Lisbon now, those who are not, who are not able to go, and uh, those who don't even know that there is an event going on in Lisbon, all the youth of this world, that they may truly encounter the joy of living the gospel and uh, come to know and love Christ, our Savior. And bless the church in Singapore, that it may continue to grow and be a vibrant Church, which which is able to spread the life and joy of Christ to all the world, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, Father. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Me. Thank you. Thank you, Father. So, just a reminder: if uh, you want to catch us on off the pulpit, don't forget this one goes out uh, every two weeks, and uh, it's on Tuesday mornings at eight thirty. As you are. Uh, listening now but also tonight join us again at 8 p.m tomorrow at 5 p.m uh we'll be on again as well you'll catch uh, the re- uh, on-call broadcast of the program um if you want to watch the interview at your own time well we have the catholic sg radio app spotify and itunes as well that's right and you can also watch this episode of off the pulpit on our ash Caesars. Uh, YouTube channel. So that's catholic.sg. Okay. And so today, once again, we want to thank our guest, Father Jean-Gabriel Pofila, a Dominican friar of the Roman province. He was recently ordained and I'm going to ask you also, dear sisters and brothers, to keep Father in your prayers. Uh, And, you know, as we, uh, you know, enjoy this wonderful um, conversation with you, hopefully you can come back again next time and uh, we can do this sometime again and chat about other things as well. With pleasure. Thank you, Father. God bless. So God bless and take care. We'll see you another time. Bye-bye.